do as thou wilt. That is the doctrine of Satan. Do what you want to do. So it's obvious that he would promote doctrine that says that anyone giving you consequences is not showing you love. Now, if you feel that you love God, but believe that a loving God wouldn't place judgment upon his creation, you should understand that this view originates from Satan. Just look at the many Satanists and atheists that hold your same view. Do you think it's a coincidence that those that believe in Satan, those that believe in doing what they want to do, or those that deny the existence of God altogether, don't believe in judgment? Please support the Freedom From Religion. Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. This is a common belief amongst all those that deny Yahweh as their creator. So if you do not believe in judgment, you should really question where this thought comes from. Like I just explained, this view originates from Satan because he wants you to believe we can do what we want without consequence. But Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, this is not his way. Do you really believe a person could deny him all of their life, go against everything he stands for, bring destruction to the lives of many, and reject the whole reason why they were created, and face no repercussion for this? You need to understand that his love for us is shown throughout the scriptures, through providing us grace, though he did not need to. As a majority, we do not let our children disrespect us and reject us without consequence. So why do we feel that it's not love for our creator to have consequences for us as well. We must understand that there is a time where we all will be judged. And whether or not we want to believe it does not change the fact that we are still judged. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. This verse is clear that after we die, there is still judgment. The Bible also explains this day of judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before Helen. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So let's be clear that there is a day of judgment. We all stand before the throne. It says clearly that if we are not found in the book of life, we will be cast into the lake of fire. The Bible allows us to understand how to be connected with Yahweh while we are alive. And it also shows us how to be in the book of life and escape the second death. And the solution is to believe in his son. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son, that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. This is John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. He has placed judgment in the hands of Yahshua, and we must believe in him. It's ridiculous to say that Yahweh is not a loving Elohim because he has a day of judgment for us all. That idea that says a loving God will not do that to his children is just a way of placing your own version of God in priority of our true creator. We are given a way of redemption. We are given a way to escape this judgment. And that is what grace is. For Elohim did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John chapter 3. One of the most irritating false doctrines people use today is that God is love. Now don't misunderstand me. God is love, but the way they are applying it is false. They always use 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 which says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. They just isolate that scripture and make it mean whatever they are trying to say love is. The problem is that they do not read on in that same chapter. This is the problem of isolating scriptures. We should go from verse 8 to read on to verse 10. Again, it says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live by him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Using that line that God is love, so he has no judgment towards us, is man's reason, but it is not scriptural in the least. Elohim's love for us was manifested by sending his son into the world, that he will be the propitiation for our sins. He did not have to do this, but he did this because he loved us. 
and gave us all individually a chance to be written in the book of life by believing in and following his son. And that's what grace is. So it is such a wrong view to say that because God loves us, he wouldn't allow us to be judged and receive consequence for our disobedience. We should all be praising him that he has not had this judgment yet. If we understood his love for us, we would see that he has been patient with us and is still trying to get our attention so that we are not on the wrong side of this judgment. Yahweh is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The thing is, we are so ungrateful, we refuse to even see that. But if you believe in Yahshua, you either do it fully or you don't. What about his parable of the wheat and tares? Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sold good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, that's while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, the harvest, I will say to them, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. He then explains this parable in verses 36 to 43 of the same chapter. So when the disciples asked him to explain that parable, he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. All those who are following his word and living for the father and his will are the sons and daughters of the kingdom. This is the wheat, but the devil has planted the wicked in the same soil. These are the tares. Remember, the soil is the world. The devil is sowing his tares amongst us. Remember, tares are indistinguishable from wheat until the final fruit appears. The tares are the counterfeit who look and act like believers, but in the end, they don't produce righteous fruit. They contradict his word. They bring nothing but confusion and spread another gospel. Understand, when the angels come to gather the righteous, we, all those who offend, and practice lawlessness, the tares, will be cast into fire. Yahshua says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, or rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Why should we fear if there is no hell? Or what about chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 41, when Yahshua says, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, Care for the devil and his angels. Just like a few verses later in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, Yahshua says, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The only one that wants you to believe that there is no hell, no everlasting punishment, or eternal fire is Satan. He is the one who spreads this lie. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Yahshua said that. You'll find that in John chapter 4, verse 23. You are not in the truth if you are saying the words and parables that Yahshua gave are not true. I made this for everyone to understand that there is judgment and there is eternal fire and everlasting punishment. Yahweh is not an evil God for allowing this because he has provided us all with a way to not be a part of this judgment. He's given us a way to escape the second death. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I feel like that's very clear. You are only a part of the second death if you lean on your own understanding and place yourself or others as an idol. If you're not letting the word have the final say and choosing to believe others' explanation, 
that don't fully apply the word and isolate scripture rather than taking scripture for what it says and following him and trusting him. This is how you be part of the second death. He is a loving God who cares for us all, which is why he has sent his son to pay the price for our sins so that we can have eternal life. We can be connected to our creator and escape judgment. He is not evil for judging us. We are evil if we choose to say we love him but not fully trust him and apply his word. It's time to make his word the priority over our lives and let it have the last say always.